Good morning, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our sem seminar today on Ngunnawal land. This week, our seminar regards the release of the 2019 Australian National Gravity Grids and the new interface to the Australian Fundamental Gravity Network. It's presented by Richard Lane and Phil Wynne. Richard Lane joined Geoscience Australia in 2001 after a career as a mineral and petroleum geophysicist with CRA Exploration Rio Tinto and program leader for the development of the Tempest AEM system in CRC AMET. As a senior geophysicist in the Geophysical Acquisition and Processing section, he has been evaluating the role of airborne gravity and airborne gravity gradiometry on a national scale. This has led to his involvement in the organisation of the internationally respected series of Australian Society of Exploration Geophysicists Workshop Trilogy, Airborne Gravity 2004, Airborne Gravity 2010 and Airborne Gravity 2016 and ultimately to being a part of the team that has produced this, the 2019 Australian National Gravity Grids, where airborne gravity data have been used for the first time. He is an ASCG gold medal recipient, a Society of Exploration Geophysicist Honorary Lecturer and a Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecturer. Philip Wynne has been with GA for over 20 years. In that time, he has undertaken regional gravity surveys, processed and quality assured and quality controlled gravity data in new frontier regions, aiding resource exploration. Phil oversees gravity surveys conducted by Geoscience Australia and the State and Territory Geological Surveys. He has taken up the role of managing the Australian Fundamental Gravity Network. Please welcome Richard and Phil. Thank you, Marina. And hello to everyone who's joined us today. I'm Richard Lane. My colleague, Philip Wynne, and I will be talking about two brand new gravity products that in their different ways will allow people to better understand the geology and exploration potential of Australia. Marina has already acknowledged the traditional owners, but I too would like to do so and to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. <coughs> Phil and I would also like to say that we're honoured to be able to present material that was the result of work carried out by a very special group of people using data supplied by a large number of organisations for whom we are extremely grateful. I'm told that we have a very mixed audience today, so we'll start slow, gather everybody up as we go along. I'll start by getting everybody up to speed on gravity and how geology influences it. It will then make sense when I talk about two new gravity products that we're releasing today. After talking about the first product, the gravity grids, I'll hand over to my colleague to talk about the second product, the new AFGN website. I'll then talk about the processing that was used to derive the different grids. There's a big opportunity to talk I'll show a lot of equations at this point, but I'll spare you from this. We'll then be able to look at the grids themselves with comparisons between the 2016 and 2019 versions, comparisons of grids with and without airborne gravity, and comparisons of grids with and without fully processed offshore data. We'll conclude by showing you where you can obtain the new gravity products and answer any questions that you might have. Gravity is the force that makes this apple, if I let it go, accelerate towards the center of mass of the earth. 
The acceleration due to gravity on the Earth's surface is approximately 9.8 metres per second squared. We are interested in gravity for geological mapping and exploration because gravity actually varies when we walk over different rocks. Here we have a profile of the strength of gravity shown over a vertical geological section. If we walk over a heavy rock type like Gabbro on the left, the force of gravity increases. Conversely, if we walk over less dense rocks like sandstone, gravity decreases. This all sounds pretty simple. However, we would see the same changes in gravity if we walk down into a valley and then up and over a hill. For those old enough to remember him, Professor Julius Sumner Miller used to say, why is this so? In this case, it's because we're getting closer or further away from the centre of mass of the Earth. Now gravity doesn't seem so simple. It means we have to be very careful to separate the small gravity effects of geology from the gravity effects of topography and unfortunately many other things. We actually know the acceleration due to gravity at the equator pretty well. The bad news is that the gravity effects of geology are quite small compared to the overall value. They affect gravity at the level shown in red. The largest of these effects is in the fourth significant figure. That means 0.01% of the signal at most. With some good news, however, we have instruments that are accurate enough to measure these effects. They're good enough to measure the weight of a typical person down to one hundredth of a gram. The first product that we're releasing today is a set of gravity grids. But what, you may ask, is a gravity grid? To answer that question, I need to go back to the start of a gravity survey. We go out and measure gravity at a set of locations such as the five locations shown here. The variations in gravity shown on this map are greatly exaggerated, but this is just an example. It's convenient for many applications to have the gravity values in a regular square pattern called a grid. We have various methods for using the scattered values that we measured and estimating what might have been measured if we had taken the readings at the centre points of this regular grid. As an aside, this grid has four rows and five columns. The grids that we are releasing today have approximately 10,000 rows and 10,000 columns in them. That's approximately 100 million cells in each grid, and that's a lot of numbers. The patterns in a grid of that size don't make much sense when they're presented like this. They make much more sense if we assign colours to different gravity values. Pictures like this are called images. When there are many, many cells, you can't see the individual squares and it looks like a continuous picture. I will show lots of images during this webinar. To make things easier for both you and me, I'll always use shades of red and orange and yellow to indicate where gravity is stronger. Shades of green where it's normal and shades of cyan and blue where gravity is weaker. Now that we've gone over the basics of gravity, grids and images, we can start to look at the two products that we're releasing today. Since the formation of 
our organization as the Bureau of Mineral Resources back in 1946. We've been responsible for managing the gravity data for the Australian continent. It shouldn't surprise anybody that we have a big database of gravity measurements. It will be less obvious that we have established and maintained four generations of survey benchmarks spread across the whole of Australia, locations where the force of gravity is known very accurately. The current set of benchmarks is known as the Australian Fundamental Gravity Network, or AFGN. The only people who will ever use the AFGN are those performing gravity surveys. This is a very small group, but without them and the AFGN, there would not be any gravity grids or any other gravity products. Today, we have released a new website for the AFGN that will allow these gravity surveyors to be able to more easily locate the nearest AFGN benchmark to their survey area and to get the principal facts for that benchmark. By taking a gravity reading at an AFGN survey benchmark as part of their survey, the gravity data can be adjusted in level to become consistent with all of the values within our national database and hence used in future gravity products. The first edition of the Australian National Gravity Map was released by the Bureau of Mineral Resources in 1976. It contained nearly half a million ground gravity points. Since then, many more gravity surveys have been carried out and more than one million ground gravity points have been added. There are places where ground gravity acquisition is just not practical. Fortunately, some incredible technology has been developed that allow several service providers to make gravity measurements from aircraft. In collaboration with the states of Victoria and Western Australia, we have been involved in several airborne gravity surveys. So, some 46 years and five editions of national gravity maps after the release of the first of these maps, we're releasing a set of grids today that are the first to include airborne gravity data. There are many different ways of processing and presenting gravity data. The grids that we're releasing today are specifically for geological mapping and exploration, rather than the geodetic applications that our colleagues in the geodesy section use. The grids have been processed to enhance the anomalies from shallow geological features. Here is the first gravity image for today. It was produced from the previous edition of the National Gravity Grids. It's a good image produced from what was the best gravity grid available to the public of an entire continent until we released a better grid today. Why did we start to create a new edition of the grids? The answer is that we have new gravity data and better processing methods than were available in 2016. There are approximately 40,000 new ground gravity observations. There are also 14 blocks of airborne gravity and airborne gravity gradiometer data acquired by government organisations, equivalent to more than 220,000 ground gravity observations. And finally, by incorporating gravity from satellite altimetry for the oceans surrounding onshore Australia, we will not only be able to interpret the geology of these offshore areas, but we can use the offshore data as context when interpreting the onshore areas. Having all of these new data sets is wonderful but there's an important technical issue to be dealt with 
before they can be combined. The data must all be consistent in units and level. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen automatically. Our surveys instruments measure relative gravity, albeit very accurately. For example, they measure the difference in gravity from one place relative to another. They measure the variations, but not the absolute level. The level of each data set needs to be adjusted to a common standard called a datum. This is a significant practical challenge. And it's the reason why we have the AFGN. Having hit the first problem for today, I'll hand over to my colleague, Philip Wynn, to solve this problem and tell us about the new AFGN website. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the AFGN. Uh, uh, as Richard alluded to, our issue is that the gravity meter doesn't read an absolute value, it reads a relative value. And to explain how we cover that, I will use an example of elevation benchmarks. So when people go around to survey heights, they use a theodolite. theodolite. And what they do is they go to a benchmark like the image you can see on the right and with a known elevation value take a reading noting the difference in the height of where they stand and then take a second reading to notice the height of the point that they want to know the elevation for and with one of only two equations you'll see today from us they then add all of this together just to interrupt you, Phil. We can't see your PowerPoint. That's a scare. Yep. Okay. So, image of the benchmark on the right. They use that known elevation. Uh, take a reading over the site they want to know the elevation for. And you can see this simple equation we use uh, to get the new elevation value. Similarly, for gravity, they take a reading at one of our AFGN stations, such as the images on the right, go to the new location and um, they then uh, notice the change in the elevation, uh, in the change in the gravity, and then they can work out the new gravity value. So if we use an example of the data that went into the current grids, um, so you can see here mostly NT and some of Western Australia, we have 107 surveys and they're highlighted by different colours. They are all different shapes, uh, different station spacing and different ages. So our earliest one is from 1959 and our latest one is from 2017. I will concentrate in this area here, um, and you can see the dates of when these surveys were collected. Now, these were all done with GPS to find their locations, so they are all fairly accurate, and we can trust the elevations and their locations. But if we don't do anything um, at all to uh, join the data together, this is what you get which is not really useful for anyone. One of the options we do have is to assume that the free air anomaly for a survey is zero. Now, the free air anomaly is one of the calculations we do, and that is to take into account the elevation of one of our observations. So again, looking at the area, we could see a red I'll call it a ridge that suddenly stops, but you can still see some structure that it continues on. However, just below that in the blue, there is a sudden cutoff and you're not really sure what's happened here. Um, you can't really make any assumptions whatsoever. This is what happens when we 
use the AFGN and tie all the gravity surveys to it. It is very smooth. You can't even see where the joins are. You can see a little bit better definition. And this better definition makes it easier for explorers and anyone else wanting to know the geology, what's going on. So the role of the AFGN, it's a series of known absolute gravity values. It provides the gravity datum, which is Australian Absolute Gravity Datum 2007 or AAGD A7. All the surveys that go into the grid are tied to the AFGN and that's a general requirement for us that all the new data is similarly tied to the AFGN. It also provides control for airborne gravity surveys. Um, so with the long wavelength. And it's also set up to be able to integrate global gravity data, uh, such as the IGSN71 datum or an absolute gravity datum. And I won't go into details for what they are, they're just datums for the gravity. And if we have a look at how it was used in the grid that is being released today, you could see that basically the whole role, if we don't have the AFGN, we don't have these grids. So this is a diagram of where all the sta AFGN stations are. And you can see there's a few of them. We have over a thousand put in established over the years, but quite a few of them have been destroyed. Now, being destroyed doesn't mean that the area has been completely washed. It could just simply mean that they've decided that they will rebuild a structure. We also have a lot of stations that we don't know the condition of. Uh, generally, if we haven't had any information on the station for 10 years, we mark it as unknown. And as you can see from the red circle, that does potentially leave a lot of gaps in our network. And of course, we've got the good stations, which people can get to. Uh, this is usually how we get to them. And while I would like a plane like this to get to a places, this is what we would generally use. Uh, as you can imagine, the distances between stations is quite long and this is really the only practical way we can do so. So to discuss the new web page, I'm gonna use an example, uh, the Parks Radio Telescope. Now Parks is in central New South Wales. It's as part of the Apollo 11 mission and it was also a movie about the dish. Uh, so most people will at least have some familiarity with the station. So this is a view of the new website. Uh, you can immediately see where every station is. And you could also uh, pull up a layer to show where the conditions of all the stations are. If we zoom into parks and then click on the dot that represents parks, you are given all this information. So for most people, the where it is with, in space is important, but the real important value is the gravity value in the lower red box. Um, as Richard alluded to, this is very accurately established so that it can provide a strong tie. We also provide diagrams for the locations and photos so that you can see that you're in the right spot and go straight to the station. So in summary, the AFGN has been underpinning the gravity data for more than 80 years. It is the basis of the new grids. It does, however, require constant maintenance because stations do get destroyed and so we have to replace them or put ones in new areas. And 
this website will allow those people who need that information to find it. And below is a link to go to if you want to have a further browse of the website. But before I hand it back to Richard, I would like to stress that there are a lot of steps between establishing the AFGF and producing the new grids, which we won't go into today. Uh, we're just going to show you the bright, shiny new thing for you. And with that, I will hand you back to Richard. These are the contents of the 2019 Australian National Gravity Grids release. So that we could properly assess the effect of adding the airborne gravity data, we produced two parallel sets of five grids, which we very imaginatively called the A and the B series grids. We're releasing both of these so that you can form your own opinion about the airborne gravity. Each series consists of three gravity grids and two elevation grids. There's also a comprehensive set of explanatory notes covering the data sets and the processing that was used. The three gravity grids have these fantastic names. Free Air Anomaly, or FAA, Complete Bougay Anomaly, or CBA, and Detrended Global Isostatic Residual, or DGIR. All they do is correspond to different levels of processing of the gravity data. The aim was to remove the effects of objects that we're not interested in so that we can more easily see the features of interest. Each grid has its good and bad points, which I will speak to. Why are there elevation grids in each of the series? Since gravity varies, with distance from the centre of mass of the Earth, the grids only make sense if we supply elevation grids that define this distance from the centre of the Earth. Out of all of the grids, the highlighted one is what I would recommend for the majority of users wishing to interpret the geology of the mid and upper crust. So just make a little note, B series, Detrended Global Isostatic Residual Gravity Grid, or DGIR B series. Using the next few slides, I'll describe the processing that we use to transform the gravity that we measured through to the grids that we're releasing. Now, gravity processing isn't something mysterious. It's actually just a series of steps where we calculate the effect of a geological feature and subtract this response from the observed gravity. I'll use this schematic section as the starting point. We will progressively calculate the effect of every part of this section. If there's anything left in the gravity data after all of the subtractions, it must mean that there was something present that wasn't in our original section. And that just might be something interesting. Gravity is all about mass, and it's the density of rocks together with their geometry that allows us to calculate the gravity effect of different geological units. I therefore show simplified density values for the various units on the section. Here is an image of observed gravity on the surface of the Earth for the area of the grids. Gravi gravity basically increases steadily from up in the north to down in the south. The effects of geology are scarcely visible. The reason that observed gravity has this north to south gradient in Australia is that the Earth is not a sphere. It's closer to being an ellipsoid with a little bulge at the equator. Points near the equator are further away 
from the center of mass of the Earth and have weaker gravity. We can easily calculate the gravity response of this ellipsoid at the locations of our measurements and subtract this from the observed gravity. This processing step is equivalent to subtracting a uniform density distribution below the vertical datum from our schematic section. The residual gravity after this subtraction has the quaint name of free air anomaly data. It's the first of the three grids that we're releasing for each series. FAA is easy to produce and can be used for numerical modeling. It's, however, not very suitable for visual interpretation. You can see that after subtracting the uniform density layer, we have all these small near surface units left over with non-zero density. These produce complex gravity effects in the data. FAA data also can contain the effects of the crust mantle boundary at depth. We have reasonable knowledge of topography and to a lesser extent, bathymetry. So we can model the near surface density distributions shown here and subtract this response from the free air anomaly data. The residual gravity after applying these terrain corrections has another one of those great names, complete Bouguer anomaly data. It's the second of the three grids that we're releasing for each series. CBA data is the standard for modeling and visual interpretation for onshore areas. It's subject to more argument than free air anomaly data by interpreters because the topography and bathymetry is not known perfectly, nor is the near surface density. It also still contains the effects of the crust mantle boundary. This produces a large level shift in gravity between areas of oceanic and continental crust. This would be fine if you want to interpret the distribution of oceanic and continental crust, but it is not very good for isolating the effects of features within the crust at shallow depth. In a fashion, we can use the principle of buoyancy, which in this context is called isostasy, to model a density contrast across a surface at depth from knowledge of topography and bathymetry. This is not strictly modeling the crust mantle boundary, but it has the desired effect of removing the long wavelength gravity effect of this boundary from the data. And so we arrive at the third and final gravity product in each series, detrended global isostatic residual data. We've modeled and subtracted the effect of every part of our section. So the residual density is everywhere zero. The data in this final grid ought to be zero. Fortunately, the Earth is not made up of uniform layers, and there are local features which disrupt the density of these layers. We see here from left to right an alteration zone adjacent to a fault, a complex intrusion and another fault that causes an offset in a layer. Each of these would have some sort of gravity expression. If we remove the gravity effects of the background elements of the section using the processing sequence shown previously, then in my favorite DGIR data, we should be left with the gravity effects of just these local features without any background signal. And in a very positive scenario for those involved in exploration, mapping of these local features may reveal the hosts of various valuable commodities. Now that we have seen 
what each of the three grids represents, I'll show images of the grids themselves. Here again is the starting point. Observe gravity. Not very useful. From there, we derived free air anomaly data. We've removed the strong gradient from the gravity data. We can actually start to see some geological features in the data. However, there are strong topographic and bathymetric features in these data. For example, the Great Dividing Range along the East Coast shows up as a gravity high, but purely because of its elevation, not because of its geology. Also, there are paired red and blue stripes along parts of the coast that are actually complex anomalies due to the ocean and the crust mantle boundary. They are definitely not stripes of high and low density material, as might be suggested. Applying terrain corrections to get complete Bouguet anomaly data removes the effects of terrain, but it also leaves a strong level shift between areas of continental and marine crust. This is useful for some applications, but not for the majority of users. This is why we need to apply the isostatic corrections. There are two parts to a global isostatic correction. Due to a quirk of history, the first of these the near field corrections and those that are measured by most commercial software are the effects of a layer boundary that mimics the crust mantle boundary out to the curious radius of 166.7 kilometers no more no less from each observation subtracting the near field isostatic correction does a partial job of removing the level shift between continental and oceanic crust regions. Subtracting the far field isostatic corrections that originate from the rest of the globe improves things further. This step is rarely done, but it really does make a difference. If you stand back and look at this image, you can see a gradient that shows up as green and blue colours predominantly in the bottom left corner through to red along the top and top right. This is the flank of a very large gravity anomaly located well to the north of Australia. It's not of interest in the current context, so we removed a gradient or trend from this grid. And so we finally arrived at my favorite detrended global isostatic residual grid. In this image, we no longer see any topographic or bathymetric effects. We no longer see the level shifts between continental and oceanic crust regions. We no longer see any gradients across the grid from anomalies outside this area. We just see the gravity effects of shallow density anomalies, the very reason and purpose that we set out to do. That was the big picture story. There are lots of improvements that can only be seen when we look in detail at the new grids and compare them with the 2016 versions. For example, comparisons where there are closely spaced ground observations, where there are widely spaced ground observations, where we've added new ground observations, and then a big one for now and the future, adding airborne data. And finally, where we've added marine data. We'll start by looking at an area east of Mount Isa, 
where there is data with spacing of two kilometres or better. This is the 2016 grid. With the new grids, we reduced the cell size from 800 metres in 2016 to 400 metres in 2019. In the next slide, we will see the same data but presented in the 2019 grid with smaller cells. There's a clear improvement in the way the data is presented. Is this improvement significant? Well, returning to the 2016 grid, I've highlighted the location of the Ernest Henry iron oxide copper gold deposit. It's associated with a 20 micrometer per second squared positive gravity anomaly. This discrete anomaly is difficult to see in this grid. But in the new grid, with the same data but the smaller cells, the discrete gravity anomaly associated with the Ernest Henry deposit is much clearer. This example demonstrates how people using the new grids will be able to more clearly interpret the same data. Next, we look at an area with widely spaced ground observations. This is an example of the 2016 grid from the Great Victoria Desert in Western Australia. The ground observations are widely spaced in the highlighted central area of this image. The method used for gridding in 2016 imposed a blocky texture on the grid with little dimples at the location of the observations. We changed this gridding method when we processed the data for the 2019 grids. This new method shown here produced a smoother, more natural result when using the exact same data points. It didn't just smooth the grid because it still fits the observations to the exact same degree. The distractions caused by the gridding method in the 2016 grid have been reduced, which will help when interpreting these data. This is an example of the data from the 2016 grid from southwest of South Australia. The new grid has some new ground gravity in this area. Here is the 2019 grid with those new data added. The improvement is quite obvious. The detail available in the new gravity data will assist those interpreting the geology of this area quite considerably. The addition of airborne gravity was a big part of the project to create the 2019 grids. Here is a very brief summary of how we combined the ground and airborne gravity data sets. The processing began with free air anomaly data. Ground and airborne data were vertically continued to a common surface called OSDRAPE 2019. Filtering was applied to the ground data to match the low pass filtering of the airborne data. The two data sets were then conformed using complementary high and low pass filters. In the final step, the edges of the conformed grids were feathered across a narrow buffer zone around each survey. Here's an example showing where we have added airborne gravity data to the grids. This is the Tanami region, straddling the border between WA on the left and the Northern Territory on the right. This image is based solely on ground gravity data. The station spacing was a mixture of two and four kilometers on the right in the Northern Territory and a very sparse 11 kilometres on the left 
in WA. The area inside the black outline was flown with airborne gravity data as part of a larger program. There were three blocks here involving two different systems. And this presents quite a challenge for data integration. This is the image that includes the airborne data. The equivalent station spacing of these airborne data is now two and a half kilometers, not 11 kilometers. To make it easier to see how well the different data sets have been combined, I've removed the boundary line from the image. The internal and external boundaries of the airborne data are essentially invisible. Returning to the A series grid without the airborne data, I draw your attention to the granite's Tanami gold deposits shown with black crosses. These load, load gold deposits are located in a meta sedimentary sequence that shows up as positive anomalies. The sequence is intruded by granites, which have ovoid shaped negative anomalies. I draw your attention to the area inside the ellipse. Since the gravity data are very widely spaced on the left hand side of the ellipse, it's unclear with just these ground data whether the perspective sequence really does extend into WA. With the addition of airborne data, it's clear that the pattern of curved linear meta sedimentary features surrounding ovoid gravity lows corresponding to granites continues some distance into WA. The airborne data have clearly added value by expanding the area of gold prospectivity. As a final example, I will show the benefits of the offshore data that were included in the 2019 grids. This image of the 2016 grid shows a part of South Australia. The Gawler Craton is in the heart of this image. It is host to some major iron oxide copper gold deposits, such as the Olympic Dam, Prominent Hill and Carapatina. The patterns associated with the Gawler Craton are truncated at the coastline and it's impossible to see the full extent of the craton. This has implications for the interpretation of the history of the craton, including the processes leading to mineralization. With the addition of offshore data in the 2019 grid, the full extent of the Gawler craton is revealed. At this broad scale, if I remove the coastline, the join between the ground data to the north and the marine gravity data derived from satellite altimetry to the south becomes essentially invisible. This leaves the interpreter free of the distraction of the coastline as a feature. In summary, we're releasing a set of gravity grids today with the target audience being those involved in geological mapping and exploration. There are two sets of grids, the A series with ground and offshore data and the B series where we've added airborne data. There's a comprehensive description of the input data sets and the processing in a Geoscience Australia record that is supplied with each grid download. As well as new data, the 2019 grids incorporate many processing improvements over the 2016 grids, some of which are shown here. I hope that the new grids will inspire users 
to revisit their geological interpretations and to aid explorers to identify new opportunities and to more efficiently focus their efforts on prospective ground. To view the new web interface to the AFGN and to download the grids, just go to the Geoscience Australia website. Click on the banner story about gravity or search for gravity and follow the links to the new products. Now, Phil and I will be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Phil. A fantastic talk. Uh, it's being described as magnificent and awesome um, and has changed the way we're looking at geology in Australia. There are so many questions. Um, I, we don't have time in the next five or six minutes to answer them all, so I will um, ask a couple, but I will also pop in the chat how you can contact Phil or Richard to follow up on the questions. Uh, Richard and Phil, will this PowerPoint be published? And if you hadn't planned to, could you publish it? Because a lot of people would like the actual PowerPoint. I'm fine with that being released. Sounds good to me. All right, we will release it on the through ECAT. Um, Ashburn asks, what is the source of the satellite altimetry derived gravity? Phil, you better answer that one. Um, uh, the source of the satellite altimetry was, um, it's a Sandwell um, and et al uh, product version 28.1 for those who follow such things. It's their compilation from uh, San Diego. Thank you. Uh, Tom asks, have you considered presenting these grids using perpetually uniform colour ramps instead of the old school rainbow? Uh, not not um, pushing a particular barrow there, Tom. <laughs> I see. Um, uh, well, you can download the grids and you can apply any colour bar of your choosing, um, perceptually uniform or not. Um, I stuck with tradition here, but I do acknowledge that um, there will be more use of these perceptually uniform colour ramps in the future. Here, here. Um, Lyle Harris asks, you said to use the DGIR grid for crustal studies. Is this also the best grid for studies of the upper mantle? That's a very good question. Um, for the upper mantle, um, the most basic, the free air anomaly, I think would still be the best grid. Um, in some ways, for the upper mantle, it's best to actually look at what we took away from the data because we took away everything from the mid to upper crust. So if you look at the things that we took away, that should emphasise the upper mantle anomalies. Um, so the, the things we rejected are the things that you want. One man's signal is another man's noise. Uh, the last question I'll take today is from Mark Dransfield. Um, and he asked a few questions, but I'll go with, is there an accompanying map of error estimates? Oh, um, We, uh, you'll see error estimates are addressed in the explanatory notes um, to some degree, um, not as comprehensively as I would like. And I think when we produce the next set of grids, there will be an accompanying uncertainty grid. Um, our colleagues in the geodesy section, um, uh, Jack McCubbin will be helping us with that. Um, and I'm very sure that that will be a part of the next release. I'd also like to add that the point data itself does have um, estimations of error in 
by all gravity uh, locations and elevations. So you can certainly create one of your own if you need to do so. On that note, um, I've popped in the chat email client services at ga.gov.au ga to contact Richard and Phil for specific questions. There are many ways to contact them, but that's one. If you know their email address, please email them or me if you want to contact them. I'd like to thank the presenters for doing an amazing job of presenting some very new um, life-changing products for us exploration geophysicists and geologists. Uh, and I'd like to um, thank everybody for their attendance and remind you that next week, we're pleased to offer two talks. On Tuesday, the 13th of October, David, David Hazelhurst, Deputy Secretary, Agriculture Trade Group, will briefly recap his talk of September 2 on Agile values and principles and their benefits. Uh, and there'll be a lot of Q&A opportunity there. And the following day, our regular Wednesday seminar will be another in our distinguished GA lecture series, Data Integration for Greenfields Exploration, Uncovering New Exploration Frontiers in Northern Australia, which will be presented by Anthony Schofield. On that note, please thank Richard and Phil, and thank you very much for your time today.